we're going to go in alphabetical order by individuals, not by regions of the world. Uh, so nobody can be offended. Uh, I'm going to start out uh, by introducing all of the panelists at once so we don't interrupt the flow of the uh, discussion. And then each panelist will talk for 10 minutes. And then uh, uh, if there are a couple of burning questions among them, we might have that. Then we'll go to questions or comments from the audience. Starting with uh, my right is Richard Burt. Uh, most of these people don't need an introduction to you, and so I'm going to be very brief, but uh, uh, it's a stellar panel. Richard Burt's managing director at McClarty Associates, where he has led the firm's work in Europe and Eurasia since 2007. Uh, from 1992 to 95, uh, Ambassador Burt was partner, partner with McKinsey and Company, to which he went following an extremely successful tour as the U.S. Chief Negotiator in the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks with the Soviet Union, successfully uh, concluding a uh, treaty. Prior to this, Ambassador Burt was U.S. Ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, before that, he was Assistant Secretary of State for European Canadian Affairs and uh, before that, the Director of Political and Military Affairs at the State Department. Uh, before he went into the government, he worked in Washington as a national security correspondent for the New York Times and with the International Institute of Strategic Studies as a research associate and then as assistant director. To my right is our own Dimitri Symes, who is running this operation overall. Uh, president of the Nixon Center and publisher of its foreign policy bi-monthly magazine, The National Interest. Uh, Dimitri was selected to run the center by former President Nixon, to whom I would say he served as much of an alter ego as one can do with Richard Nixon. He traveled regularly with him in the last years of his life uh, to Russia and other former states and was really an inter, uh, uh, intimate partner of uh, President Nixon in his activities. Before the center was established, Dimitri served as chairman of the Center for Europe, Russian and Eurasian Programs at Carnegie. Uh, earlier, he was director of the Soviet and Eastern European Research Program at the Nixon, uh, NHTSA School at SAIS. And before that, he was senior research fellow and subsequently director of Soviet studies at CSIS. To my immediate left is Richard Solomon, who is president of the United States Institute of Peace virtually since its inception and has overseen its growth into a center of international conflict management analysis and applied programs. Uh, prior to uh, this, uh, uh, Dick was Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Public Affairs. Uh, he, among the many things he did, negotiating a Cambodian peace treaty, the first UN Perm 5 peacemaking agreement. He had a leading role in a dialogue on nuclear issues between the United States and the Koreas uh, and helped establish the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Initiative. In 1992 to 93, Dick served as U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines. Before that, he served as Director of Policy Planning at State Department and was uh, a colleague of mine on the NSC. In 1995, Solomon was awarded the State Department's Foreign, Foreign Affairs Award for Public service. And on my far left is Ambassador Mauro Vieira, who is Ambassador to the United States from Brazil. Before being appointed here, Ambassador Vieira was Ambassador to Argentina. 
He holds a JD degree from the Federal University of Rio, Rio de Janeiro and graduated from the Instituto Rio Branco, the Brazilian Diplomatic Academy. At the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations, Ambassador Vieira has had several positions, including Chief of Staff to the Secretary General and Chief of Staff to the Minister of External Relations. From 19, 2003 to 2006, he was representative of the Brazilian Ministry of External Relations to the Board of Directors of Itaipu Bayou Nacional Hydroelectric Plant. Ambassador Vieira has also held positions at other Brazilian federal agencies, such as Secretary for Managerial Modernization at the Ministry of Science and Technology, Assistant Secretary for Science and Technology and National Security, the National Secretary for Management at the Institute for Social Security at the Ministry of Social Security and Assistance. Ambassador Vieira has also served at the Embassy in Washington before, from 1978 to 82. He's been uh, uh, served at the Mission for Latin American Integration Association in Montevideo, the Embassy in Mexico City, and the Embassy in Paris. Uh, and now uh, we will turn to Ambassador Burt for first comments. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Brent. Uh, as I uh, looked over the uh, title of the uh, of the panel uh, maybe ten days ago or so, when uh, when I was beginning uh, to think about what my contribution would be. Uh, I saw it talked about the new great power dynamics, and to tell you the truth, I didn't understand what that meant. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> is that your title? Did you come up with that? I did. Okay. <laughs> so I have already succeeded in offending two people on this panel, <laughs> having said ten words. Uh, the reason was I, I didn't, I couldn't tell whether I was meant to talk about new dynamics or new great powers. But as I thought about the subject, uh, I decided at least that it was probably both. So I'm going to spend uh, just a few minutes here talking about new dynamics in terms of, uh, of the international system, as well as uh, a new group of, of more active players in, uh, in this new system. And I, I will do so by making uh, four or five quick points, which, uh, which my fellow panelists are, of course, welcome to challenge. And thank you, Dimitri. And, uh, and ho hopefully uh, lead to a uh, productive discussion following our presentations. My, my first point is, I guess, if I put it in bumper sticker form, is welcome to the new world of geoeconomics. Uh, what is interesting both in terms of the old great powers as well as maybe the new cluster of, of powers is that they are all in one form or another preoccupied now with developments in the international economy. Of course, how they're being affected by those de developments are very different indeed. Uh, we have seen over the last four or five years highly asymmetrical growth rates between the old classical G8 countries, the United States, the Europeans, and, uh, and Japan, and the, uh, the so-called BRIC countries, so where you're seeing a, a fairly low growth on the part of the classical powers, you're seeing, for the most part, uh, quite amazing growth on the part of the Chinese, the Indian, the Brazilian economies, amongst others. And uh, these growth rates are beginning, in my view, to make an important strategic difference. Is they, are, they are leading to fundamental changes on how capital flows are actually being allocated worldwide. Not only are, are the new states investing in their own infrastructure and growth, but they're increasingly investing here. And <coughs> Uh, money that isn't being used to pay down debt in the old world is increasingly going to the new states. 
And that is going to accelerate, in my view, uh, the, the emergence of not only the BRIC countries, but, but other countries in what used to be and should never again, in my view, be called the, uh, the third world. And, and as part of this growing change uh, in geoeconomics, uh, you do have, because of the tremendous deleveraging requirement that now the United States, the Europeans, uh, most of the Europeans face, you are almost, again, in my view, uh, going to be, we are going to be living through a period of, uh, of much greater parochialism in Europe, parochialism here, and I'll have more to say about that, uh, a focus on, on uh, dealing with our mounting debt problems and uh, a growing lack of support for international engagement by the old G8 powers, which will open up real, real opportunities for, uh, for the new states, the G20 countries, to play a bigger role. That leads to my second point, which is to focus for a minute on something I'm supposed to know about, and that is Europe. I don't think, as some people like to suggest, that we are, at the, we are witnessing the, uh, the beginning of the end of the European Union. But I do think we may be seeing the end of a, of a different concept related <coughs> to the European Union, and that is what people call the European project, the idea that Europe is, in, is engaged in a continuous process of, of building a bigger Europe, a broader Europe, as well as a deeper Europe. The European Union succeeded in an era of growth, prosperity, and jobs. It is deeply challenged. It is not designed or built to deal with the era that is, it is now beginning to confront. And many of the contradictions that were built into the European Union uh, are beginning to manifest themselves. The first, economically or financially, is the contradiction between monetary union on the one hand and national fiscal decision making on the other. And that is highlighted graphically not only by the Greek crisis, but, uh, but uh, similar deficit problems and debt problems in the so-called Club Med countries. Not only uh, Portugal and Spain, which you can read about in every newspaper, but, uh, but also uh, even larger economies like, uh, like, uh, like Italy. Politically, it is going to have an impact, in my view, principally though, not on the Club Med countries, but on Germany's role within the European Union. Germany has embraced the European Union for both economic and political reasons. Economically, of course, Europe was a tremendous market for German goods. And in fact, Germany, which depending on how you count, was either the world's largest or the second largest exporter last year, exports 50% of its product to its European neighbors. If it now seems inevitable that uh, many of those neighbors are going, going to go through a gut-wrenching period of austerity. Germany is not going to have the export opportunities with its nearby neighbors that it's, that it's had in the past. And at the same time, unprecedented demands are going to be placed on the Germans to engage in either transfers of money to, uh, to support these countries substantial loans, such as the one that was, uh, was agreed a, a week ago, or a restructuring of debt, which is going to disproportionately affect German financial institutions. This is going to lead inevitably to a populist backlash in Germany. And any of you who happen to read uh, the Bild Zeitung, the largest circulation newspaper in the world, know that that populist backlash has already begun. And German politicians uh, who routinely supported European Union and even the notion of a federal Europe, a United States of Europe, are going to back away from that. And Germany is increasingly, in my view, going to play a more unilateralist role in, uh, in Europe as a whole. In other words, we are going to see the return of the German question in terms of, of Europe's, uh, Europe's future. 
One real uh, impact, in my view, will be an effort by the Germans to look for markets and political relationships beyond Europe. And the first place they will look, because they're already highly engaged in developing a what uh, Angela Merkel calls a partnership with Russia, will be the Russian Federation. And the, the Russians will, will get m more deeply engaged in, uh, in working uh, closely politically and economically with, uh, with the Russians. And uh, that, will have, uh, that will have a chilling effect on any opportunity for the Europeans, for example, to establish a common energy strategy which would give Europe more leverage vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis -vis Russia on uh, gas and, and oil supplies. Uh, there is also uh, uh, the underperformance of the European uh, of, of European institutions. The old model for how Europe worked was the Franco-German accommodation. That the decisions were taken in a smoke-filled room in the back of uh, European meetings, where the French and the Germans decided what the result would be. But the Europeans have reformed themselves out of that simple model into an enormously complex and, as I said, underperforming set of institutions with over, overlapping jurisdictions, undefined roles, and, uh, and lengthy and inconclusive debates. The role of the European Parliament has grown and it has begun to take the initiative on a range of issues uh, which cannot be managed by either the Council or, or, or the Commission. The competition after Lisbon between the Council and the Competition uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the Council and the Commission are clearly going to grow. And the European Central Bank will be asked to play a bigger role. My view is, is that because of this institutional underperformance in Brussels, more and more decisions are going to go back to capitals. And so you're going to see, in a sense, a backtracking, a, a renationalization, if you will. Of, uh, of European economic, political, and I would argue geopolitical strategy. That leads me to my third point. As, uh, as Europe kind of steps out of the game, has less attention to pay to, to regional issues like Ukraine, is not able, to, uh, not able to bring in new members that would have a stabilizing impact on <coughs> wider regional concerns like Turkey, you're going to see, because of the end of the Cold War, because of economic globalization, and this great growth that's taking place in emerging markets, new regional players and aspiring global powers. They couldn't ask for a better example than what we all woke up and read today, the deal that was brokered by Turkey, Brazil, with Iran on uh, enriched uranium. But another example, which is also a kind of subtext you can read about today was the fact that the Iraqis just made new decisions about selling off uh, their oil assets, and the uh, the, uh, the 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 two buyers the the two buyers uh, that were awarded oil contracts in in Iraq were uh, were China and Turkey. So you can go down the list pretty quickly, but it's a it's a pretty simple list. But you see the Russian Federation using its not its ballistic missiles, its instrument of influence and power in the Cold War, but its gas and oil to uh, carve out a new sphere of influence, a customs union with Belarus and, uh, and Kazakhstan, its use of Gazprom to negotiate concessions from the Ukrainians on uh, its naval presence uh, in uh, extending its naval presence in the Black Sea, and its propo proposals for new security arrangements in Europe, which would, of course, de-emphasize the role of NATO in favor of new institutional uh, relationships. China, of course, despite uh, its, uh, its public policy of rising peacefully, has clearly got its, uh, got a strat its strategic eye <coughs> on the South China Sea. It is engaging in a buildup of its naval capabilities that are clearly designed to uh, to block U.S. naval access to, uh, to East Asia and the South China Sea, its attack submarine program, and perhaps its, own, its development of its own carrier capabilities uh, demonstrate uh, uh, clear uh, regional ambitions. India, the same is true with its own naval expansion. 
uh, and its uh, policy uh, in Afghanistan, which is, in my view, principally designed to, uh, to encircle Pakistan. Brazil, its growing concern about, for example, U.S. military cooperation in, in Colombia, uh, its uh, growing criticism of different facets of, of U.S. foreign policy, and, uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, uh, its willingness uh, uh, to play a role in terms of, 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 of vital uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. and Western interests in, in the greater Middle East in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Turkey, spurned by Europe, uh, which uh, will go down, in my view, as a great strategic mistake by the Europeans. Growing skepticism of, uh, of American ties to Israel is, in, is pursuing uh, an increasingly independent course uh, in some would argue trying to carve out a kind of Ottoman space for, uh, for a much more uh, active uh, foreign policy in the Middle East as a broker, as a broker between, uh, between uh, the, the uh, Arab world and the West. This leads me uh, actually to, uh, to my fourth really and final point. We have, I think, moved strategically from a G8 world to a G20 world. The G20 countries are not simply a new class of economic powers. They're a new class of strategic uh, and geopolitical players. Part of this, as I said, is due to globalization. It is due to this changing uh, economic uh, balance of power wo worldwide. It is, to go back to the discussion we had this morning, I would argue in part it's due to the fact that the United States has been diverted from a kind of global view and uh, sense of its priorities in the world by by its military commitments in uh, Iraq and uh, AFPAC and, uh, and, uh, and by, uh, by Europe's slow absence from the world stage. So that leaves me finally with what kind of, uh, what kind of response should there be from the United States to the, this <coughs> changing strategic map? Uh, they can't be what uh, I would describe as the Obama administration's response, which is simply to list some, some very attractive global goals, uh, things that we would like to see happen, whether it's the elimination of nuclear weapons, whether it's a Middle East uh, peace agreement, uh, or reset of relations with a specific country like, like, uh, like Russia. It can't be a list of processes either, uh, like becoming multilateral or being engaged or having summits or proximity talks between uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. For the first time, I would argue, since the late 1960s, when the Nixon administration adopted a set of very difficult, complicated problems, <coughs> the uh, Vietnam War and its, and, and, its, and its implications worldwide, the United States needs a strategy. We need to begin by defining national interests, Recognizing, as someone said this morning, I think it's James Schlesinger, our limits, and that means when you recognize limits, you set priorities and then define the steps you need to take to achieve them. Thank you very much. Richard? Dimitri? <clears throat> it's always very difficult to speak after Eric Bert because he's not only profound uh, but uh, so agreeable that uh, I'm almost compelled to say uh, that I uh, kind of yield my five minutes uh, because many of the points which I want to make were already uh, articulated brilliantly by Mr. Bert. Uh, I'm also lucky uh, that uh, S in terms of this panel is at the front of the line because obviously if uh, we were addressing great powers uh, in order of their real importance, it is very unlikely that we would start with Russia. Uh, China most certainly would come first, and arguably Brazil, by many criteria, is also a more important and certainly more dynamic nation, at least as far as BRIC is concerned. Having said that, uh, Russia is important in terms of uh, many fundamental American interests. And uh, General Scarcroft, Ambassador Berthe, and me were all together on the Commission on U.S. Policy toward Russia, chaired by uh, Senator Hart and Senator Hegel. And we were uh, very much in favor of improving U.S. relationship with Russia, and that was basically 
uh, the bottom line of our recommendations to the Obama administration. But let me repeat where Ambassador Byrd has left us. We were recommending that not because we loved Russia, because we thought it was a democratic country, because we were very impressed with Russian culture and poetry, and I am very much impressed with them, but because we thought that uh, pursuit of important U.S. foreign policy objectives required a better relationship with Russia than we had during the previous administration. I am happy to say that we have a better relationship with Russia and uh, a kind of an emotional animosity which we had in Moscow and Washington alike at the end of the Bush administration, which clearly was an obstacle to our ability to work together, that kind of an emotional animosity is no more, and President Obama deserves credit for that. What worries me is that as uh, during so many other administrations, once we begin improving relationship with the country, we immediately uh, uh, begin to assume that since they have uh, a better relationship with us, they also have a greater virtue. That is not necessarily the case. And I think it is important for us uh, to see Russia the way it is, the way uh, the Russians see their country themselves, not through the prism of uh, our interests, of our relationship. We have our interests, we should establish our priorities, but when you establish your priorities, at first, you establish the facts. So these are a few facts about Russia. First, clearly Russia, during uh, the first part uh, of uh, this decade, was a very successful country by any criteria, most Russians criteria relevant. That means that democracy was not a relevant criteria to most Russians. But in terms of their stability, in terms of their prosperity, in terms of being taken seriously as a world power, there was a considerable uh, progress during first years of the Putin rule. Regarding democracy, let me mention a recent public opinion poll conducted by a so-called Levada polling organization, which is somewhat in opposition to the government and is taken quite seriously. According to uh, this public opinion poll, only 32% of the Russians thought that uh, democracy was uh, an important value. And only 14% said that they would not be prepared to sacrifice democracy if it was required by other more important interests, such as security, stability, and prosperity. So if uh, Putin rule was not quite delivering democracy, that was not considered a problem by the vast majority of Russian citizens. But there was an unwritten contract. The unwritten contract was we, the people, do not mess with the decision-making problem prerogatives of our government, but the government delivers to us guns, butter, and self-respect. Uh, the financial crisis, the financial crisis has affected Russia very badly, much worse than other BRIC countries, worse than the United States, worse than uh, many, if not most, European countries. And, uh, you cannot say that uh, Russia was exposed like the king is naked, but it became clear that the king most certainly was not uh, parading on a white horse, as uh, the Russian citizens got used to believe during the first years of the Putin rule. And uh, the economy is beginning to recover, but there is still a uh, major shortage of credit. There is still great reluctance to invest. There is still a greater outflow of capital from Russia than an investment in Russia. And there is a sense, I shouldn't say of despair, but of a certain societal pessimism, which we have not seen during first years of the Putin era. I'm very much in debt to Ambassador Bert, who invited me together with a number of others to a very interesting evening 
with uh, two uh, prominent uh, uh, Russian entrepreneurs, not only successful in terms of business, but also politically quite savvy. And both of them used an interesting term describing the Russian situation today, stagnation. And they said that the only period in the Russian history they could compare uh, uh, the current era with would be the Brezhnev period. Now, I would not go quite that far, but I would say that what they said was revealing. And a lot of uh, members of the Russian elite and prominent uh, citizens of different persuasions and ordinary people alike seem to think that something went wrong with the Russian experiment. When Medvedev uh, became a uh, Russian president, the first assumption was that he was Putin's puppet. He fairly quickly managed to demonstrate that that was not quite the case, that he is a serious, self-confident leader who most definitely uh, believes that he is a genuine partner in the Russian decision-making process and who takes orders from no one. Then there was a second assumption, that there was a serious tension between Putin and Medvedev, and Medvedev was in favor of a far-reaching reform. And if he could not do everything at once, it was only uh, to be expected, because Putin still was prime minister, because you don't want to break too much glass in Russia, because Gorbachev have demonstrated that once uh, you start with radical reforms, you may never know when it is going to end. But there was an expectation that Medvedev was in favor of radical reform, and the relationship between Putin and Medvedev was perceived as a great drama, as a, a competition between uh, a radical reform, or at least fairly meaningful reform, and status quo. I think that today most people assume that Medvedev is a very important Russian leader, and that it is quite possible that he will be selected for second term as Russian president. But there is also a perception that once Medvedev was able to establish his own niche as a more modern, more pro-Western politician than Putin, that he did not want to go beyond that. And that basically the way Russia is ruled, basically it is not so different under Medvedev than under Putin, and it is not just a question of Medvedev's limited power, it is also a question of his personal inclinations. In this context, let me mention one paramount problem in Russia today, and that is systemic corruption. Uh, there are many other problems, but the reason I am mentioning corrup corruption in particular, because it creates a situation when nothing is working in Russia the way it is supposed to. Uh, they uh, uh, increase their defense budget, but according to the Minister of Defense, Mr. Serdikov, between 30 and 40 percent of all the allocations for new weapon systems is being stolen. That is according to the Russian Minister of Defense. Uh, foreign investment, there is a lot of talk, but uh, uh, we have seen what happened to BP what have uh, had happened to IKEA, what have happened to a number of foreign companies in Russia which were perfectly prepared not to interfere in Russian politics, to defer to the Russian government, to play by the rules. And they all have discovered that they could not get any justice in the Russian court system. Even very prominent companies, personally known to Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev, but most ominously, there is a problem with introducing uh, change uh, in the climate of this pervasive corruption. The problem is that if you uh, allow any genuine opposition, if you entertain a possibility of serious elections, you know, you have to assume that terrible things may happen to anyone who is in power today. Uh, just look at Ukraine, where uh, uh, Former Prime Minister Timoshenko was summoned to Procurator's office and was accused of corruption. It is very difficult for me to think about a politician in Russia, about a senior official in the cabinet in the presidential administration, 
who would not be concerned about a similar fate if there was a genuine opposition, genuine elections in Russia. And we are not just talking, you know, about allowing opposition to come to power. Try to think about congressional subpoenas. Try to think about independent TV. Uh, this pervasive corruption is a major obstacle to Russian development. It is forcing every member of the Russian elite to ask a soul-searching question. Yes, we know that things went badly. Yes, we agree that we need change. But are we prepared to risk our own fortunes and our own fate? And let me then finish with one foreign policy issue. When you think about relations with uh, other major powers, particularly on democratic powers, I think you should be analytical and unsentimental. I think you should not refuse cooperation with them simply because you don't like the way they ruled when this cooperation is in your interest. But you also should, should not, you should not invent things, fabricate things, deluding yourself simply because you need them as a partner for whichever reason. Today there is a major announcement uh, in Washington by Secretary Clinton about uh, a deal the administration was able uh, to make with China and Russia about new sanctions against Iran. And this is a front page story in the New York Times. It's uh, presented as a major development. Once uh, I was told about that by our very well-informed uh, colleague, Ambassador John Evans, I immediately, of course, read the New York Times story, and then I went <coughs> to Russian TV website. And uh, I found there that uh, their main story was that Russia and Ukraine were brothers forever once again. <laughs> so I was, uh, as you can imagine, a little puzzled. So I called a senior official in Moscow who is normally well informed about matters like that. And I congratulated him on the deal at the United Nations. And he said, uh, thank you for your wonderful joke. What else is going on? <laughs> well, look, we had three rounds of sanctions against Iran. There was never a question in my mind that we may have a round four if we treat Russia and China with a modicum of respect. The question is what kind of sanctions? There is a story about uh, uh, a prominent collective farm chairman during the Khrushchev era who was presenting a report, and Brent, this is really my last paragraph, who was presenting the report uh, to the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And he said that they were able to increase the milk output by 50%. Khrushchev said, but can you increase it by 75%? And the collective farm chairman said, of course, Nikita Sergeyevich, but then it is going to be just water. So I'm sure that we, can, that we can get Russia to support uh, sanctions uh, against Iran. The question is, what kind of sanctions? And it seems to me what we need in our relationship with Russia, and hopefully partnership with Russia, we need a clear criteria, not an appearance of success, but our ability to get results which really address important American priorities. I'm glad that we have a better climate and relationship, but a better substance, in my view, is yet to come. Thank you, Dimitri. Richard? Thank you, Brent. <clears throat> and thank you for your introduction, although I have to tell you, just as you were saying those nice words about the Institute of Peace in walks, my predecessor, Sam Lewis, who he's going to have to share the rap for me for developing this institution. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to join you all today to talk about one of the two structural issues that will affect uh, world, world affairs and certainly our relations for a long time to come. One, of course, is our dealings with all the turmoil in the world of Islam, and the other is China. And to put China in perspective, you obviously have to take a certain historical perspective. I want to begin with a quote from Napoleon, who just about two centuries ago said something I think many of you have heard. He said, let China sleep, because when the dragon awakes, she will shake the world. <laughs> now, if you talk to a Chinese about uh, Napoleon's perspective, uh, he or she will say, yeah, we've had two bad centuries, but, but now we're shaking the world. Indeed, indeed they are. And more than that, 
President Nixon and uh, his side call, sidekick, uh, Ron Walker, down there, they had something to do with wakening China. And uh, of course, our dealings, the opening to China in the early 70s was a fundamental change in the dynamic of the Cold War, much to our benefit. Uh, and now we're in some ways paying the, uh, the price of having awakened the dragon in, in way, ways that I think you're all aware of and I'll comment on, on very briefly. So the big issue for the United States and for China as they warily look at one another is in fact how are they going to orient uh, themselves both in their bilateral relationship and in the rest of the world. Uh, over the last uh, decade or so, there's been a lot of uh, debate in this country. Is China going to be a peer competitor, a threat? Uh, is it a country that can we, we can work with? Is it going to uh, overpower our, our economy with its uh, unprecedented uh, takeoff of about 10 percent a year growth for, for a generation? And China is in a position where <clears throat> It is now approaching its fourth generation of uh, leadership since the Mao era. And uh, having been over there recently with, uh, for discussions with senior leaders, I would say they're, they're uncertain about where they want to take their country. I can't help but share with you uh, something that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. The idea of old Mao in a business suit, uh, of course, is, is somewhat laughable, the old man couldn't tolerate the kind of bureaucratic structure that has, uh, under Deng Xiaoping, enabled the country to take off in the way it has. As, as you all know, I think, during the Cultural Revolution, Mao basically tore apart the system that uh, came out of the revolution, and it was Deng Xiaoping who was, in some ways, the real revolutionary, uh, making possible this, this dramatic growth. What is in China's head in terms of the way it deals with the world? Uh, the traditional perspective, which I think weighs very heavily in the thinking of uh, even its current leadership, uh, which is very much technocratic, uh, managerial, and collective in its approach to uh, running the country and its view of the world, is something that uh, the historians refer to as the tribute system with China, as its name implies, the center of its, its part of the world and the countries around it, the king of Vietnam, the, the king of Korea, and other, other even Japan, subservient to the predominant uh, economic uh, and cultural influence uh, of China. And you can certainly see the way the Chinese are managing their affairs as trying to recreate this kind of a situation. Militarily now, they're, they're promoting a very active military buildup that seems designed to uh, exclude the United States from East Asia as a stabilizing security influence. In the realm of economy, they, they talk about uh, an East Asian uh, free trade zone that would exclude the United States. And, uh, in classic fashion, the Chinese seem to be building up uh, a coterie of client states who, uh, which we say, don't seem to be peers. North Korea, Burma, Sudan, Rwanda. It's reminiscent of uh, what, what China under Mao did during the Cultural Revolution. If, while the country had turned in on itself in, in this domestic uh, political turmoil, China's one international partner was little Albania, and uh, to people on the outside it looked a little ridiculous, but uh, the Chinese do not seem to feel comfortable dealing with, which we say equals, or, or countries of, uh, of uh, roughly equal status. Even uh, during their alliance period with the Soviet Union, that broke down uh, after a decade and provided the opening for, uh, for the Nixon administration's uh, initiative towards Beijing. So the question is whether the Chinese will try to establish an independent power center and what will the countries in the region, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, and others do as the Chinese attempt to establish this, uh, uh, which we say preeminent uh, power, power center. 
The 21st century for China, indeed for the world, is, is not the, uh, the world of the 18th or 19th or even the 20th century. China's vulnerabilities today are not the, uh, the barbarians from the north, the nomadic tribes that uh, led to the Great Wall being constructed as a defensive measure. It's not the sea barbarians, the British and even the United States who uh, uh, sought to contain China during its revolutionary period. Today, the, the primary challenges to the security of the Chinese state are domestic. Uh, it's their population and whether their people will be satisfied with the deal that the leadership uh, has made that is, will provide stability uh, and economic growth, uh, but stay out of uh, politics. The great fear of the Chinese, the Falun Gong. I mean, it's again, it's, it seems a little bit ridiculous. Here's a uh, small Buddhist-oriented uh, exercise society that threatens to uh, attract a great mass following in China, which uh, even if uh, the leadership of the Falun Gong says they're apolitical, uh, could very well become a, a political force as the Communist Party tries to uh, dominate everything. The demographics in the country do not work uh, in China's favor over the longer run, given the aging of the population. They haven't come to terms with uh, ec uh, ethnic unrest in their border areas. While the Tibetans or the Uyghurs are a very small percentage of the country's population, uh, the Chinese haven't figured out how to uh, accommodate uh, these ethnic minorities. Water resources, secure energy, these are the kinds of issues that the Chinese need to, uh, to deal with if they're, if they're to establish a, a stable uh, and enduring state. And to do that, the Chinese cannot be autarkic. They can't uh, establish a situation where they stand alone in the world. Uh, they re really have to figure out how to operate as a member of the P5, uh, the UN Security Council, uh, and to deal with Japan, to deal with the United States, Russia, and, and many other uh, powers. Now, where China heads is something that we don't have a whole lot of influence, but we do have some ability, I think, to get in the heads of the fourth generation of uh, leaders who are now emerging. China, by the way, is in the midst uh, of a succession crisis. Over the next two years, uh, the top leaders, uh, Hu Jintao, uh, Wen Jiabao, will, will be replaced. And their politics is uh, showing some signs of the kind of internal rivalries that uh, one might expect uh, in a succession process. And I think it's one of the things that uh, lay behind the, uh, uh, the, the tension, the pressure that uh, China was building uh, recently on uh, the, our leadership for a change in its approach to Taiwan, not receiving the Dalai Lama, Again, getting at uh, many of the issues that uh, relate to China's view of its, uh, of its uh, place in its region and the world. Uh, will the Chinese accept the fact that the United States can play a stabilizing, balancing, or buffering presence in e East Asia? Certainly, if you talk to leaders in Japan, most of them, in South Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, they all want the United States to uh, endure in the region as a stabilizing presence or as uh, Henry Kissinger would put it, as maintaining an equilibrium. Is that, is that something that the Chinese will, will accept, will uh, go along with? And uh, as we look at our own budget and uh, other constraints, is that a position the United States can itself uh, maintain? And then there's the Taiwan issue. When uh, we normalized with China, Taiwan was still uh, an issue of the Civil War. Chiang Kai-shek was still alive, and the Chinese leadership thought that uh, Taiwan be, would be so demoralized by normalization with uh, the United States that uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek would throw in the towel. That has not happened, and uh, yet we have seen a remarkable, and I would say for all concerned, a very constructive evolution of the situation on the island. Basically, uh, the mainland has now economic, social, political relations with the island. Uh, they have substantially uh, 
moved away certainly from seeing it as a civil war issue and the question is whether uh, Beijing is prepared to further demilitarize the Taiwan Strait and come to some kind of uh, political accommodation uh, which I think would certainly serve Taiwan's interests and uh, those of the United States if, if not those of China. It is a significant question and uh, one where China has, uh, however reluctant they may be to admit it, has moved the situation in a positive direction, but it's not uh, an accomplished fact. And finally, there is a positive agenda uh, where the United States and China could find common cause in today's world. Uh, there's certainly the economy, how long we can sustain this uh, situation where China holds such a huge proportion of our national debt, where we provide them a major market uh, uh, for their goods as they desperately try to maintain a growth rate of 8 to 10 percent, which again provides the internal stability that they, they are term determined to maintain. That is, that is an issue that, uh, again, we know from just reading the papers in terms of exchange rates. Uh, and uh, other aspects of uh, our economic uh, relationship uh, need to be worked. Nu nuclear proliferation, a problem that uh, the Chinese see more as uh, of concern to us than to them, but uh, whether North Korea, whether Iran proliferate will have a significant effect on China's interests as well as our own and those of uh, our allies. Energy security, ethnic unrest, Again, these are issues where we and the Chinese uh, could find common cause if, if the attitudes in Beijing were such to uh, support it. So we're at a time of uh, real uncertainty about where the Chinese are headed. Uh, there is reason to be uh, somewhat uh, optimistic that uh, the leadership uh, will see its interests in, in a more collaborative uh, relationship but it is by no means the, an assured evolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, General Scowcroft. I uh, would like to make a few remarks, being the last to speak. I don't want to take much of your time, but just start saying that uh, I don't like very much labeling Brazil as a uh, great new power. I prefer to refer to my country as an emerging country with a large territory, with a large uh, population, multi-ethnic uh, society, but not exactly as a power, because I think it's, uh, it has a different uh, meaning and it can be interpreted in a different way. But uh, what I really would like to focus in my remarks is on how to consolidate the rise of these new um, emerging countries in a manner that it's consistent with the preservation of rule-based and multilateral international architecture. Multilateralism is for Brazil the first step. It's the way we relate with the world. And I would like to also to add another remark. I think that there certainly is the case to be made for the reform of international institutions based on the legitimacy of these same uh, institutions. Uh, it's not only discussing the legitimacy, but it's always also uh, to remain effective. I think that, uh, and this is the, the position of Brazil, that the institutions that govern the world uh, have to be both uh, legitimate and efficient. Uh, that's to say that it's uh, no longer possible or desirable to talk about a number of issues and to tackle a number of uh, great uh, global issues without the participation of large countries and big economies such as the one that we mentioned here before, China, Russia, and India, and so many others. Uh, I think that uh, we have to consider these days the main international issues such as climate change and we cannot uh, consider this issue without considering the contribution that uh, both uh, Brazil, uh, in the Brazil, India, 
China and South Africa together with the United States made during the last December summit in Copenhagen, the, the, the COP15, when uh, the negotiations took place between these countries to uh, save uh, the, the conference and get to an uh, acceptable uh, result. Um, I also would like to mention that uh, in terms of trade, we just heard the, the remarks on China, and you cannot think of trade today without considering China, the size of China and the impact of China. Uh, if we consider the economic crisis of the, of the year 2008, you cannot think only of uh, the way it was solved, but why it was solved by the G20 and the way that the G20 is working together to try to find solutions to the major and pressing uh, problems that affected the, the world economy. Uh, I think that, uh, as was mentioned before in this panel, the G20 replaced the G7 or the G8. And I think that uh, the first sign of that happened maybe in 2003 during the Cancun um, meeting of the WTO Doha round when for the first time a number of countries with similar positions, especially in agriculture, got together and created or launched the, the G20, not the G20, the financial G20 of the IMF, but the G20 of the Doha round, which uh, wanted to make uh, the, the Doha round a development round. And it was the first time that the uh, negotiations in, in this uh, context of the WTO took place between Europe, the United States, Japan, and a new group of countries, a new group of nations, uh, which were integrated by China, India, and Brazil, and which in this way brought together the, the G20. I also would like to make a very short remarks on the global governance uh, related with the United Nations, that we also think that it's, it has to be legitimate and it has to be efficient and that's why it's needed to be reformed. We believe that the, the framework the, the framework that resulted from the Second World War is no longer no longer represents uh, the world today and that uh, all the decisions uh, have to be taken taken into consideration the presence of large countries, large populations such as uh, I mentioned India, Brazil, or many others, Indonesia, and so many others. Well, I finally would like to make a, a very short remark uh, on the 2008 crisis, saying that uh, the uh, G20, which was conveyed uh, in 2008, it was not realized, it was not conveyed out of generosity only, but it was conveyed because a number of leaders in the world realized that uh, the issue should be tackled and should have the, the participation of many other countries such as Turkey, India, Mexico, South Africa, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and so many, Saudi Arabia, and so many others. So uh, I would like just to close my remarks saying that for Brazil, uh, it's the, the, the ideal framework of the, the, to, to govern the world is through multilateralism and that uh, we expect uh, this multilateralism to be, uh, to, to be able to accommodate the presence of large countries uh, such as I mentioned. And I think that uh, we have to make a great effort to try to avoid in this new architecture the same asymmetries of, uh, of the past. Uh, well, th those are the, the main remarks I'd like to make, and of course I'll be ready to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Before we go to your questions, I want to make just a couple of comments about something which was touched on by our four speakers who concentrated, rightly so, on their own uh, areas of the world, and that is the term globalization. 
uh, Rick Burt mentioned economic globalization. I think this is a much more pervasive force that impacts the BRIC, the United States, and everybody else. And it's something, I think globalization now is akin to what industrialization was 250 years ago. It's changing the character of our system, just as the Westphalia governing system replaced that kind of amorphous sovereign system of the Middle Ages gradually. I think globalization is now growing and is an uneasy coexistence with the Westphalian system. Uh, but globalization, unlike industrialization, which built the power of the nation state system, globalization is undermining it in a sense it's make it's erasing national borders. And as our speaker said, more and more of the issues that face us cannot be dealt with by the nation state itself. But you have to reach out, whether it's, uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's economics, uh, whether it's information technology, all of these things are changing the way we have to do business. And that is happening, I think, much more rapidly than the mindset, which is still firmly fixed in the 20th century. Uh, and we're, we're, we're groping. Several of the speakers mentioned the G20 system. Well, the G20 system came out of a crisis. But what are we fundamentally operating with? The Bretton Woods system, which was built in 1944 in a world which is very different from our own. So we're recognizing and struggling with it, but this is an overlay to, uh, to this new brick system of states which we still tend to look at in the traditional sense. Now we've got uh, about 20 minutes. Be happy to take your questions. Yes, sir. Um, Harlan Ullman, my uh, question stems from the interesting title of a fascinating Army field manual called Money as a Weapon System. That, of course, was referring to SERP funds or what commanders could use to uh, pay for certain projects. It seems to me, Brent, you are absolutely right with a shift away from Brenton Woods, and you, Rick, are right in terms of geoeconomics. But given the fact that the euro is in decline, the renminbi is uh, over, or is undervalued, it seems to me you could make an argument that the dollar is going to be reinforced as a central currency for the foreseeable future. That could change. If that's the case, is there some utility in determining how money as a strategic lever or political instrument in the case of the United States? might be used in terms of monetary and fiscal policy, or given our recent near-death experience with derivatives and subprimes and everything else, is that a bridge too far to contemplate? In other words, does money provide us the new version of old weapon systems in these changing worlds? That's a good one. Who what? Rick? Well, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question, Harlan, and I think you're, you're your basic premise uh, about the, the problems that uh, the euro is encountering and questions about uh, Chinese and their decisions about currency, I think, uh, do reinforce the dollar as, 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 as a reserve currency. Um, not necessarily, you know, indefinitely, but I think it, it, has, uh, it has brought to an end uh, an effort on the part of some Europeans to try to position the, the euro as a as an alternative reserve currency, at least in the in the near term. But uh, your your point about kind of financial uh, diplomacy or the use of currency uh, as a as a uh, as an instrument of influence is uh, yeah the dollar the dollar is a is a fine instrument of influence and anybody can buy it can buy dollars and anybody can use them. Our problem is that in the foreseeable future, we're not going to have enough of them. And I mean that in a, in a variety of different ways. I was listening to the panel this morning uh, talk about our current conflicts in, in Iraq and, uh, and uh, Afghanistan. And I thought about our panel this afternoon, and uh, Dick Solomon raises the, the Japanese effort to expand their sort of naval 
presence in the, in the Western Pacific. And I ask myself, you know, where is the money going to come from for the United States to kind of maintain even ex existing naval presence in the Western uh, Pacific, given the costs of our commitments in the greater Middle East and the costs of replacing much of that equipment that we've, that we've worn out there. Uh, it's, and, and Bob Gates has already, uh, I think, indicated, signaled very clearly that this is going to be a period of great austerity in terms of U.S. defense spending. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, whenever these problems arise, people call for Marshall Plans. Uh, I, I worry not just about the fact that we have this uh, tremendous uh, deleveraging process that we're going to have to go through uh, over the next 10 years, but I, I worry about the willingness of the American public to, uh, to spend money to support a system of global engagement not just militarily, in terms of aid programs, in terms of our presence abroad in every manifestation, at a time when uh, money is going to be enormously tight, and there is, you already see with movements like the Tea Party, I think a real populist backlash to the idea of, uh, of the United States as a global power. I mean, what's interesting to me from a foreign policy perspective about the Tea Party is these people are not the uh, neoconservatives of a decade ago who are like Bill Crystal advocating, you know, a, 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 uni, a unipolar American dominance. They're, they're kind of talking about a populist retrenchment. Ron Paul gets his foreign policy from the Cato Institute, not from AEI. And that's the flavor of the month now in terms of, 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 of American politics, both on the right and the left. So yes, there's going to be, in my view, because of, of the, the rise of, 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 of geoeconomics, there, there's, money is going to be more important. Resources and commodities are going to be more important in international politics. But that doesn't mean it's going to help the United States in, in relative terms, I think that money is going to go to places like Russia, like Canada, and a lot of money is going north of the border now because of commodities. And, and it's going to be, I think, it's going to be a, a time of, 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 of real uh, uh, difficulty for, for the United States. Other comment, Dick? Just very briefly, uh, I thought uh, General Scowcroft's points about the uh, which we say unease that many countries have with the uh, Westphalian system, the nation-state system, as globalization uh, leads to greater interaction, if not integration. That's a direction that the Chinese feel very uncomfortable with. They uh, they are still in a they are in a sense in a century behind much of the uh, the world, the West, and Europe. <clears throat> They will be ruthless in terms of issues like exchange rate, in terms of uh, ripping off other people's uh, intellectual property in their efforts to maintain uh, a level of economic growth that for them is the, the foundation of political stability. And uh, so we will go arm wrestling with them about uh, exchange rates and uh, other issues, the intellectual property issue, foreign investment being at the core of it. Uh, but the Chinese at the, at fundamentally will be focused on uh, maintaining this high level of growth for their internal political stability. Uh, that reminds me uh, uh, only to the point that not only do we have to, will the American people sustain this kind of engagement, will the Chinese, because they have been providing through their purchase of treasuries the liquidity which we needed to do it. Correct. The back row, the lady, yeah. Wait, clear in the back. Thank you. Mark Katz from George Mason University. Uh, this is a very interesting panel. I noticed, though, that there was not a speaker who talked about uh, India and how it fits in the uh, emerging great power dynamics. I just would like to invite anyone on the panel who cares to to say something about that subject. Thank you. Anyone want to say something about Africa? Nobody wants to. <laughs> well, I made a, I made a couple of comments, but I don't have anything to add. 
Barbara. Let me make one point about India, and that's the same point we can make about uh, uh, Brazil. Uh, we have uh, an illusion uh, in the United States that if nations are democratic, uh, if uh, uh, nations believe in free market, that they would uh, follow in lockstep with American foreign policy. And I think that Brazil have demonstrated that this is not the case, and I think the same is happening with India. And if you look at uh, uh, foreign policies of leading nations, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for correcting us, uh, emerging great nations, not necessarily great powers. The Chinese always object when they're called a great power because they're different, they're benign. But the point is that it is difficult to say, Senator McCain probably would disagree with that, but it's difficult to say that as nations become democratic, they necessarily tend to become more supportive of the United States. So there may be more democracy in international politics, but not necessarily more automatic support for the American leadership. Barbara? Uh, Barbara Slavin, um, I can't resist, uh, since we have the ambassador from Brazil here, to ask for a little bit more clarification on the agreement that was made with Iran. What are Brazil's expectations for this agreement? Uh, is there some sort of time limit? What if Iran doesn't send its letter to the IAEA within seven days as promised? What if it begins to try to negotiate it, uh, renegotiate uh, the deal, as has often happened in the past uh, with Iran? Will Brazil be prepared to, to say that it made a valiant effort and, uh, and failed and support uh, a new sanctions resolution at the UN? Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, well, first of all, I cannot tell you much more than what's on the papers. And I, what I want to, to, to let you know is that Brazil acted in good faith all the way uh, to help to find a negotiable uh, solution together with Turkey and many other countries that expressed to us uh, the same feeling and to avoid, uh, at this moment, to, to avoid another round of, sections, uh, of sanctions and very difficult sanctions which would uh, maybe only affect uh, uh, the population and the, the, the civil population of Iran and also uh, that would create a domestic uh, turmoil in Iran and would make uh, the, the whole society more resistant to uh, negotiations. We acted in good faith together with other countries, as I said, with Turkey. And there is, uh, Iran is supposed to send the letter to the uh, agency, to the atomic agency in Vienna in about a week. And we think that this is, Especially, this was very important as a confidence-building uh, decision. Uh, there's a lot to be said after that. There is a lot to be negotiated, but that's the very first step in the right direction. And it's important that we could accomplish this, uh, uh, this uh, agreement. And I think this is the kind of contribution that countries such as Turkey and Brazil could make at this moment. Thank you. Yeah, right. Fritz. Uh, Fritz Ermart, uh, Russia question for, for Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri, by now you surely read that long foreign policy agenda uh, that came out a few days ago. Um, what strikes me as a list of a, a laundry list of desirables to which every functionary in the Russian foreign ministry made a contribution or two. Uh, two general themes, you know, one is that Russia should proceed more with smiles uh, than with frowns. That's uh, a welcome note. Uh, and then in the, in the commentary by Lavrov and uh, some of the press that picked it up, uh, another theme that's a little more troublesome and that is that Obama is regarded, uh, Obama and his administration are regarded as very positive phenomena for the advancement of Russian national interests, but likely fleeting to repl be replaced um, in 1912, uh, I mean 2012, by uh, a return to a harder line policy. Uh, what's a little bit troubling with that assessment is that it sounds like make hay while the sun shines. 
and some of that hay might be troublesome. What's your sense of what's behind that document in terms of Russian politics uh, and Russian foreign policy thinking? <clears throat> well, first of all, th this is a document uh, which represents a kind of a draft presented by uh, the Russian foreign ministry for uh, the consideration of uh, the Russian government as a whole. And uh, uh, consideration so far uh, apparently did not take place and it was not discussed at the Russian Security Council. So I do not uh, want uh, to minimize the importance of this memo prepared by Foreign Minister Lavrov, but I don't think it's fair to say that it is an authoritative statement of the Russian foreign policy. Uh, if you read this uh, memo carefully, I think uh, you are left with two impressions. First, that clearly it is a very pragmatic document. Uh, if somebody thought that the uh, Russian government is guided by imperial nostalgia, that they will go all around the neighborhood uh, creating trouble, that they would try to overthrow governments left and right simply because they want uh, to join NATO or to have uh, a good relationship with the United States, that's not the direction of the document at all. Uh, this is a document which uh, focuses on Russian domestic economic development, which assumes that uh, uh, a novel ambitious foreign policy uh, is a vice, and which quite correctly assumes from my standpoint that uh, if they want Western investment, they should not attempt uh, to split the United States from Europe, that it would work only to their disadvantage. At the same time, you clearly can see that precisely because it is a pragmatic document, you are not talking about uh, a return to Mikhail Gorbachev when there was a sentimental desire to embrace the West, to be accepted as a part of uh, transatlantic civilization. I uh, remember a, a passage uh, from memoirs of somebody, General Skalkroft knows well, Anatoly Chernyayev where he talked, among others, about you. And he was asked, why didn't uh, we raise a question of uh, putting uh, NATO enlargement, or rather no NATO enlargement, on paper uh, uh, with the US government, with the Ger German government, British government, particularly when the likes of Margaret Thatcher were making clear that they were against NATO enlargement, or even according to Chernyayev, unified Germany. And uh, Chernyayev said, I could not bring myself to talk to people like Brent Scowcroft about putting the things on paper, because that would be an example of an old thinking. We, we were working together. We were creating a new global environment. This was the new thinking. Uh, people who are in charge of foreign policy today, starting with Sergei Lavrov, they are very unsentimental people. They know what uh, their interests are, or at least the way they define them. They don't want artificial confrontations. They have absolutely no uh, uh, sympathy for Iran. Uh, they uh, send a Russian uh, envoy to see President Ahmadinejad, and uh, apparently the conversation was very badly. The Iranians were as unreasonable in private as they were in public. But at the same time, Russia looks at its own economic interests. Russia looks at its desire to be taken seriously. Russia does not want uh, kind of to be marginalized vis-a-vis -vis China, or for that matter, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Brazil in India. And they are reluctant to do anything for the United States or for uh, Western Europe because it is right. They want to do things which they believe are in their interests, they believe in quid pro quo, and they like to be paid in cash now. Okay, one more question. Yes, ma'am. My question is to Mr. Richard. Well, I just wanted to ask you that uh, seeing the present situation in Belarus-Russia relations, do you think this union is really possible and it will continue, especially after the way they have started supporting the Makiev and the Kyrgyzstan issues. And another uh, question of mine is, I have a little difference of opinion with you. You mentioned that uh, in Afghanistan, India's presence is 
mainly to encircle Pakistan. Well, uh, being an Indian, I feel that it is, uh, they can fight with Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan in a different way, and they can solve their issues not by being the presence in Afghanistan, but Afghanistan being its uh, neighbor, it's, uh, I mean, it's very important for India to maintain security and peace in the region, which is uh, uh, creating a severe concern uh, for India, and that is the main reason, according to me. What, what, what was the first part of your question? First part was that is the uh, you mentioned something about Belarus Russia Union. Uh, oh, oh, oh. And I just uh, wanted to know, uh, know from you that seeing the present situation, the way uh, Belarus is moving away from Russia, and the leaders uh, have <coughs> differences of opinion in many issues, do you think it's going to continue and is it really possible? Okay, well, I, I don't want the answer to be any longer than the question. Okay, well, you may hear it twice. The, the, an, the answer to your first part of your question is, I, you know, the Russian proposal for creating a customs union it would include Kazakhstan and Belarus was a classic screw-up. Uh, and it, it, it had little to do with the substance of Belarus and Kazakhstan. It had to do with the decision that was taken at the very top of the Russian government to slow down the WTO process. Uh, after that decision was taken, by most, most economic specialists, including the uh, Minister of Economics, weren't even aware of that decision when it was taken and were surprised by it. It's taken about six, nine months for the Russians to turn that decision around. They're now, they've now taken the position that, yes, they will, they will come into the WTO by themselves, and then Kazakhstan and Belarus will follow. But I think it did reflect a kind of mindset on the part of some in the Russian government to uh, not to reestablish the Soviet Union, but to try to create a, 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 sphere, a, a sphere of Russian influence that mis, misfired in that case. On your question about India and Pakistan, I'll just say very, very briefly, I completely understand where psychologically where the Indians are. I mean, they, they have suffered from terrorist attacks. Uh, the B Mumbai bombings had a deep impact on, on, the, uh, on the Indian population. Uh, it wasn't the first such large-scale attack. After all, there was an effort to actually wipe out the, the leadership of the Indian government in Delhi in a famous attack on the, uh, on the parliament. So, so I understand why India uh, has taken uh, the a, a position it has, and in fact acted in, in, acted with I think a great deg degree of caution and restraint in dealing uh, with uh, those terrorist threats. That said, that said, I think India could play a uh, a uh, a very productive role in in working to eliminate some of the core issues at stake in the in the Indo. Pakistani relationship, and by that I mean Kashmir. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. It won't resolve all of the issues in play. But, uh, but uh, if, if India was prepared to find a solution to that problem, I think it would reduce the problems in the Indo-Pakistani relationship and thus make it less necessary for the Indians to be so reactive to, uh, to Pakistani activities and to have to and, and to get involved in in places like uh, Afghanistan, which are, in my view are, are mainly are mainly driven by the con the continuing high level of distrust and tension in the in the relationship with Pakistan itself. If you want uh, to understand what happened between Russia and Belarus, you have to look at sources of Russian foreign policy conduct. And of course, there is imperial nostalgia, but I don't think that that what defines Russian foreign policy. And of course, there is an interest in a cooperative relationship with the United States, including an areas nuclear, but that, in my view, also what does not define Russian foreign policy. What defines Russian foreign policy is that in Russia, you have a unique relationship between the state and the private business, particularly between the state and major energy companies. And uh, you have a situation when the state uniquely protects energy companies. But you also have a situation when energy companies often dictate official policy. 
uh, with Belarus, uh, Lukashenko, who is, how to put it, is not a very pleasant dealer to deal with, but he, in a way, is taking a reasonable position. He is telling Moscow, you want to be like the United States. You want to be big guys in our neighborhood. So take care of us. Offer us some financial support, particularly because you have all this economic energy largesse. But uh, even when uh, Lukashenko, in terms of his domestic policy, looked quite agreeable to Moscow, they did not want to subsidize him. Now they got a very friendly government uh, in Kyiv. Uh, one would think that they would treat this government very delicately. Less than a month after Yanukovych becomes president, Putin makes a public statement on TV, on TV, without any consultation with the Ukrainian government, suggesting a merger between Gazprom and Ukraine Naftogaz, Ukrainian energy company. And they're making clear that they're, that they're talking about Russian takeover of the Ukrainian energy system. If there was something Yanukovych did not need, it was that kind of approach. And it was very strange for the Russian president to do something like that. But if you take Putin as primarily uh, a man in charge of Gazprom, then it begins to make a perfect sense. He put the interests on the table, and now they are going to negotiate. Uh, and that, of course, creates uh, constraints on Russian foreign policy effectiveness. The foreign policy is ambitious, then the willingness to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention, and please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion.